Okay. So a warm, warm welcome to everybody joining us uh, for today, day two of our ninth annual D3 meeting. We had a very exciting day yesterday looking at the interplay between innovation, pipeline, access, financing, um, data share with a deep dive at the end of the day into the successes behind sleeping sickness. Um, looking at the kind of partnerships that were driving sustainability and the actual success story of sleeping sickness itself. We heard um, the, the great gains uh, in that particular area. Just a few days ago, Equatorial Guinea announced uh, elimination of sleeping sickness along with other countries in the last few weeks. Um, so a lot of momentum there. Kigali, the Kigali summit would have really highlighted, as I'm sure all of you know, the great gains that have been made um, in terms of control and, and elimination. Underpinning all of that, central to all of that, is the, the concept of diagnostic testing and diagnostics per se. Um, it is the first step in terms of development and implementation of the strategies for treatment and control. And really, if anything, the COVID pandemic has really brought into kind of a very, very sharp focus the critical role of diagnostics within the health system no diagnostics in place lead to a kind of presumptive uh, diagnosis, putting those patients uh, into the wrong treatment pathways. Um, and that's particularly uh, bad when it comes to uh, ELMIC settings, low middle income uh, country settings in terms of resource uh, strapped settings. All of that leads to poor health outcomes. And downstream of that to kind of make to molecular based approaches um, and looking at capacity building in the diagnostic landscape. Um, but we, we're honored to have the opening session, look at NTD diagnostics and the future of disease elimination. We're joined by Dr. Sarah Nagaro, the, one of the principal scientists at FIND, the Global Alliance for Diagnostics. Um, Dr. Bruno Levesque from the Department of Translational Physiology, Infection and Public Health at the University of Ghent. And also Dr. Aubrey Cunnington, um, from the Digital Diagnostics for Africa Network and the Imperial College London. So I think that's enough from me. Um, I would say to all of the, uh, the attendees who have joined us, uh, please do give your name and uh, country and affiliation in the chat box a quick hello. Um, and thanks a lot for joining us. And I think we're going to hand the floor over to you, Sarah, for the opening. Um, talk. So I think I'll just ask the other panelists a quick hi to everybody, sorry. And um, just if you could just back out in terms of the, the, the cameras and the, the microphones, and I'll hand the floor over to Sarah. Sarah, over to you. Okay. Thank you very much, Cameron. And uh, you've got my slides to project, correct? So thank you very much. And, and thank you very much for inviting me to speak today at today's meeting and very excited to, to be here with, with you all. Um, just before I go into further into the presentation, I just thought I'd give a brief introduction uh, to FIND. So as Cameron mentioned, FIND, the Global Alliance for Diagnostics, seeks to ensure equitable access to reliable diagnostics around the world. And we do this by connecting countries, funders, decision makers, healthcare providers and developers to spur diagnostic innovation and make testing an integral part of sustainable, resilient health systems. We were founded back in 2003 as a product development and delivery partnership. And since our founding, actually, our strategy has evolved to expand our portfolio of diseases that we cover, the longest standing program being neglected tropical diseases and TB, to now include pandemic threats, malaria, fever, AMR, and uh, hepatitis, as well as non communicable diseases. So the scope of our activities has also broadened, not only to focus on diagnostic and innovation, but going from R&D all the way to clinical trials, implementation studies, capacity building, and a lot of activities around access that allow diagnostics to be implemented into integrated approaches. And the last thing I'd, I'll say on, on FIND is that since the creation of the WHO DTAG group, we've been observers on the DTAG, and we're also members on some of its subgroups. Next slide, please. And the one after that. Great, thank you. So all of you, I think, will probably have seen this uh, diagram or figure from the WHO NTD department when they published their new roadmap um, in 2020. 
And what this heat map shows is that there's a critical gap in actions required to reach the 2030 targets. And one of them is clearly the lack of diagnostic tools, which is a prerequisite to achieve the targets for some of these diseases. So for some of these diseases, we're using 19th century tools to address 21st century problems. With the exception of two NTDs that are shown here in green, yaws and snake bite envenoming, all other NTDs either have no existing diagnostic tests, so that's the ones highlighted in red, and others that require uh, ad adaptation or need to be modified or access, access to these tools uh, needs to be improved in order to reach the targets. And those are shown in the orange and yellow. And these NTD gaps have many root causes, but perhaps can be followed into, you know, uh, summarized into four points. First one is around the lack of data and the guide to interventions and investments. The second one being around few development partners um, in the space. Third one is about lack of or no deliberate effort to establish an information mechanism that could avoid duplication of effort. And also probably the last one is that there are new treatments that required improved diagnostic tools. Next slide, please. So until the COVID-19 pandemic thrust testing into the spotlight, diagnostics have been a silent partner in healthcare, receiving little by way of international attention, funding, specific uh, country strategies, or even dedicated budget lines. And this was further highlighted in the recently um, published Lancet Commission on Diagnostics that was published last year, where 47% of global populations has little or no access to diagnostics. In that same year, 2021, WHO released the latest essentials medicines list, and that exists since 1977. And it's a list of documents that um, all medicines that are considered to be essential to ad address key public health needs globally. So whilst that's been sort of an established list, it was not until 2018 that WHO published its first essential diagnostic lists. And diagnostics, to no surprise here, um, are a neglected area of global health. For most NTDs, actually, diagnostics are a market failure situation and as such are not commercially viable enough to attract private investment. Consequently, very few diagnostic developers engage in this area, contrary to COVID, as we've seen uh, in the past two or three years, where developers are in the hundreds. Furthermore, as some of these diseases and NTDs approach the last mile of elimination, falling infection rates precipitates the need for increasingly sensitive tests. But progress in R&D is slow and fragmented, with a lack of engagement and coordination between governments, industries, donors, and development actors, leading to duplication and potential waste of scant resources. Next slide, please. So really closing the diagnostic gap uh, then is a prerequisite to achieving the global ambition for NTDs. But really, I think we can summarize this into three main axes and it will require a collaborative effort from all stakeholders involved, create visibility around the di diagnostic landscape and invest in existing diagnostic tools but all of this under the leadership of countries and country-driven initiatives. Next please. So the first one is really about collaborating and being creative. We recognize that there is not going to be a one size fits all when it comes to NTD diagnostics. And to ensure that we meet the 2030 targets, we need global frameworks that enable industry manufacturers and pharma companies to engage in the whole process, starting from R&D to supply chain and logistics. They need to share knowledge, learnings and innovation across multiple diseases. This translates into breaking silos and finding new ways to harness power of existing products, technologies, and infrastructures. It's around creating economies of scales for regional manufacturing hubs. To optimize maximum access to technology and relevant intellectual property rights for NTD diagnostics, it's also important to think about ensuring that such rights are broadly available in NTD endemic countries and that they are affordable. Next slide. 
So as I mentioned at the beginning of the, the discussion is that whilst each NTD have their specific challenges, there are also um, some very clear common areas for action that are common to all NTDs and that are equally important if we want to reach these targets. And these cross-cutting areas seek to maximize the use of existing resources, to reduce duplication of efforts, to connect the right stakeholders, and to increase efficiency. So let me just take a few minutes to describe two activities that are underway um, at FIND to help create this ecosystem and visibility um, and transparency around NTD, uh, supporting NTD diagnostics. The first one is around the virtual biobank initiative uh, called the GX Connect. And I believe uh, one of my colleagues spoke about this initiative earlier on this year. But very briefly, uh, the DX Connect virtual biobank, it's an open access resource that provides a global view of aggregate data on sample collections from various institutions, irrespective of where the samples are physically stored. It is not a single collection of specimens held at a central location, but rather it means to connect and make available to everyone at the centralized network collections stored globally. And really what we want to achieve by this virtual biobank is to address the long-standing issue around lack of transparency and equity in the collection and distribution of the use of human specimens. And what we're trying to achieve through this online portal is to make available these well-characterized samples for test development and evaluation. And through this online portal, um, we seek to connect sample providers that can register their collections, while sample requesters can search through the database for the samples that meet their requirements and their needs. And currently to date, there is seven um, collections already in the virtual biobank for samples on Beruliosur, Schistosomiasis, Hat, and Leishmaniasis, and, and more collections are, are in progress. The second initiative that I'd like to mention about is we're currently working on an open access online portal mapping diagnostic uh, products for NTDs, as well as the funding landscape. And really the aim of this portal is to create visibility across the NTD diagnostic landscape, harmonizing multi-sectorial efforts and creating robust information platform from which new collaboration synergies and innovation can grow. And there's maybe two main uh, purposes or there's multiple, but two that I'd like to focus on. First one is to drive advocacy to address critical uh, product and funding gaps. And the other one is really aimed to reducing the likelihood of duplication of efforts. Um, and whilst this is now online, we will be inviting industry and donors and others to provide information to contribute to this mapping. And we're, very, we're working very closely as well with the WHO DTAG to harmonize efforts uh, in this. And my last slide, if you can uh, go to next, please, thank you is finally the development of new diagnostics is a complex process and the time from development to implementation can actually be very lengthy as well as very costly. So in the, inter in the interim and to address the current need, there is a use of training or retraining laboratory staff in the use of existing diagnostics uh, tests that are available and the establishment of robust quality control systems that are effective um, approaches to achieving short-term improvements. So whilst we recognize that there is a, a, a long road ahead to bridging the NTD diagnostic gaps, um, but when there's governments and industries, donors and development actors are bound by the shared global goal, and as we can see this through the achievements that have been made in the past decade within the NTDs, it will set us in a good position to reach the 2030 NTD targets. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much uh, for that, Sarah. Wonderful presentation um, and really setting the scene in terms of what needs to be done, as well as highlighting the amazing strides forward uh, that FIND have been making um, and, and how active they are in this particular area. So we really appreciate that. Thank you very much for that, Sarah. Much appreciated.
we've had um, quite a few people joining us in terms of the audience. Just a quick shout out to Dr. Luth Lorimer from the uh, FIBRA study at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in London. Uh, Dr. Insaf Bel Haji Ali from the Institute Pasteur joining us from Tunis in Tunisia uh, this morning. Hi there. Um, Francesca Pfeiffer from the Digital Diagnostic for Africa Network um, here in, in Peru College and, and Gasso Koulibaly from the Côte d'Ivoire. Um, good morning to everybody and thanks a lot for joining us. We'll have the Q&A at the end, so do get, you know, feel free to send your questions in. And to the other attendees, please don't be shy. Please say hi and give your name and country affiliation. Some very uh, you know, big points uh, made by Sarah there in terms of what needs to happen or some of the kind of landscaping around how do we get to those targets. Um, I'm sure a lot of that's going to come into the Q&A at the end. So thank you very much for that. Sarah, that takes us on to our next um, uh, speaker. Um, and for that, we'd like to give the floor over to Dr. Bruno Levec from the Department of Translational Physiology, uh, Infection and Public Health at the University of Ghent. So over, a round of applause and over to you, Bruno. Thanks a lot, Chairman. And also thank you for giving me the floor to provide uh my view on diagnostics to guide the NTD community towards the WHO 2030 goals. And uh, I will use SDH as a, as a case study. Um, so I just want to acknowledge a few people that uh, inspired me to, 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 to wrap up this, this, this presentation. Um, I'm not going to name them one by one, but these are the people that have been instrumental for me to gain new insights in the, in the topic of that what I present uh, today. Also, as a spoiler alert, I'll just start with the summary. So the key, the key thing that I would like you to, to, to remember after my talk is that it's the diagnostic specificity, specificity rather than the sensitivity that will be important if we go towards elimination of diseases. Also, that there are multiple options of specificity and sensitivity, and that the diagnostic performance as such is linked to the study design sample throughput and cost per test. In other words, improving your tests might require less samples, which might have an impact on the sample throughput and the cost per test. And then finally, I will make a call for to be very cautious for appeal to future discovery fallacy. So this being a spoiler alert, let's start with the, the, the beginning of my presentation. So I think we all agree, and also emphasized by Sarah, is that diagnostics for NTDs are put very high on the priority list of the WHO. And that could be sustained by a variety of reports by the DTAC that was established in 2019 and two consecutive reports, 2019 and 2020. But then if you look then on what this group has produced is massive, right? And it has produced now about 12 different target product profiles for a variety of different neglected triple diseases, of which five just recently this year, five on skin and TD. So this is really, really promising. Like I said, I'm gonna build a case around SDH. The reason why I do this, because there, there I feel more comfortable with. I've been working on SDH for a decade now. Uh, so that's why I prefer to work on SDH or to focus this presentation on SDH. So, Indeed, there has been a target product profile for SDH with the intended use case for monitoring and evaluation of SDH control programs. So in other words, it's very much linked to the 2030 targets for SDH. So what are these targets for 2030? Well, six different targets has been identified and I've listed here, this is just a screenshot of the table of the document. But there are two targets where diagnostics are going to be very crucial. The first is to achieve and maintain elimination of SDH morbidity. And this is defined as being the uh, prevalence of moderate to heavy infection intensity below 2%. So as a note, it's very important that we are able to quantify infection intensities. The second is to reduce the number of templates needed in uh, preventive chemotherapy for SDH. This might be a bit strange in diagnostics part, but it has a link to diagnostics. It has a link, which is basically based on this um, decision tree in terms of the frequency and the intensity of 
Maastricht administration, where based on an assessment of the prevalence of any SDH, the frequency of MDA or stopping MDA is decided. You can see here the yellow box. This is just highlighting the most important decision thresholds going from 50, 20, 10, and the 2%. So the 2% is in this case for SDH, if the prevalence of any SDH is less than 2% is decided to stop MDA. Just, just to give you a flavor of what kind of prevalence this is we're looking at for stopping MDA. I will take this further during my presentation. Good. If we briefly summarize, I'm not going to discuss the TPP of SDH in more detail. The document is available online at WHO. But in summary, the minimum diagnostic method that we're looking at for SDH is laboratory based, needs to be quantitative, again, a link to this infection intensities, should be applicable to all age groups, should, be, should not take more than one week to train. The diagnostic performance specificity should be at least 94%. And sensitivity should be at least 60%. And in terms of sample throughput, at least seven samples per hour, and the cost should not exceed um, three US dollar. Now, as you may expect, um, I would like to draw the focus on the diagnostic performance because in, in contrast to what we have been reading and what we've been assuming um, up to now, that sensitivity is more important if we reach up to this elimination threshold of 2%. This is not the case. This is not what is in the TPP. In the TPP, it states that specificity should be higher than the sensitivity. And I think um, Katie Gass um, noted it well, well, well in advance, and she wrote a viewpoint on it where she explains in more detail. We're not going to explain in more detail why it comes, but she concluded indeed that the specificity if we're looking at these very low prevalence thresholds for elimination, it's the specificity that is important. And if you look all to the different TPPs that have been published so far, TPPs uh, looking at MDA-driven um, uh, NTDs, you can observe consistent, consistency across these different documents. Specificity is more important than sensitivity. Good. If I take us back to the STH world, um, we too, we assess this through, through a variety of studies. And indeed, we could prove that specificity is important rather than sensitivity. So if you look at this table in a nutshell, is that sensitive specificity should not drop below the 94%, whereas the sensitivity could go beyond 60%. What this study also tells us is that it's not only the specificity that's important, but there are also different options, right? There's no such single value for specificity and a single value for sensitivity, which is good because it allows the R and D to somehow gives more room to deviate. So what we listed here is the, for each specificity, each value of specificity, the minimum sensitivity. So for, you can see that for each specificity, there's a different number. And in essence, there's a correlation between both parameters. If you reduce the specificity, then your sensitivity will be much higher, vice versa. If you have a very good specificity, then the requirements for your sensitivity can be lower. In extreme case, 99% specificity. So the top value in this table requires only sensitivity of at least 60%. Whereas if I go to the bottom of the table, if the specificity is only 94%, then you cannot uh, go beyond the assessment sensitivity of 86%. So these two things I would just would like to, to highlight. Um, what we also assessed is, okay, is there any um, link between your diagnostic performance and your sample size in the field? Why is that important to look at? It is important to look at because if you can show that your uh, diagnostic performance performs better, which imply that you have less samples to be collected in the field, in a way, the savings that you have in the field could be uh, included in more cost per test or less throughput. And that's what we, I would like to show here in this uh, figure. 
But before that, let me enlarge the figure. So this figure basically indicates the required sample size to, re to take reliable decisions uh, to stop MDA for SDH for a variety of theoretical um, diagnostic methods. So different combinations of specificity and sensitivity. So if you look at this graph at the X axis, you have the sensitivity going from 60 to 100%. Remember these values from the previous slides. And then you have the Y axis. This is the sample size. And where can we find the specificity? The specificity here is indicated in a color code. For instance, this line represents different diagnostic methods with a fixed specificity of 94, but of course with different values of sensitivity. Good, another way, um, if we want to look at improving the test, we go from left to right is improving the sensitivity and from top to bottom, it's improving the specificity going from 94 up to 100. In other words, the perfect test is this little dot. So what this graph tells us is that first of all, if we improve either the sensitivity or we improve the specificity, we can see a drop in sample size. So let me take the orange line here. The orange lines representing a specificity of 100%. We can see that the sense when the sensitivity is 60%, we have about we need about 350 subjects. If we improve the sensitivity up to a perfect test, we have about 200 subjects. So indeed, improving the sensitivity increases, uh, decreases the sample size. Is the impact the same for specificity? No, it's different. Improving the specificity just with one, two or 3% has a major impact on the sample size. So. Uh, this has become clear already because we can see the range of the sensitivity goes from 60% to 100%, whereas for the specificity, we go from 94 up to 100%. Yet an increase of uh, a few percentages results in a huge impact in, in the sample size. In other words, investing in the specificity will allow to reduce the operational cost more than investing in the sensitivity. Again, something that's very important for the r and Let's take it one step further. Um, I've been talking about the sample size, which is operationals in the field, but what's linked, very much linked to it, this is the cost per test and also the throughput, because these somehow are linked to each other. So the question is, if I can improve my test, how much more my, cast, my test can cost or how much more can I reduce my sample throughput, but still having the same total survey cost than a simple, perhaps more cheaper or with a higher throughput. And this is what we examined in this particular paper. And this is also presented in the graphs. And let's here also, let's have a look at these graphs in more detail. And I'll start with this one. So what this graph tells us, it gives us the relationship between a cost per test and a sample, sample throughput for a certain theoretical test. And the theoretical test here is that the test is that's at the top of the graph is that it has a sensitivity of 80% and a specificity of 94%. And giving this, sensitive, giving this diagnostic performance to make reliable decisions to stop MDA for SDH, it's requested to have 10 schools and about 350 subjects per school. Again, this is a theoretical exercise. So this is a diagnostic method that we're looking at. And um, we, are using, we are using the cost of, as a reference method, the Cato cat sticks me, which is a reference method, which allows a sample throughput of nine samples per hour and has a cost of 1.34 US dollar which in total, if we look at 10 clusters and 350 subjects per cluster, comes up with a cost of 14,500 US dollar. And this is also marked with the dots here on, on the graph here. So how should I interpret this graph? Each of these lines, and let me focus on the purple line, which is indicated by this yellow arrow. This line presents any combination of, of cost per test or sample throughput 
that eventually results in the same survey cost of 14,500 US dollar. So this helps us to look at what is the maximum cost per test allowed, or can I counter the increased cost for sample throughput? So when the following slides, what we've done here, we just improved the specificity. The specificity jumped from 94 to 96 and then from 98. So we are improving the specificity. We keep the sensitivity fixed. What you can see at glance, again, focusing only on the purple lines indicated here by the yellow arrow, is that there is a shift downwards the right side bottom corner, which indicates that for um, you can really reduce the sample throughput and you can also increase more increase the uh, the cost per test still having the same cost of 40,500 US dollar so in other words this framework allows us to guide more to make more strategic choices in terms of sample throughput and some also for in terms of cost per test So that brings me to my final point of my talk, and is that beware of the fallacy. Um, this is a, a, a viewpoint that I written with, co-authored with uh, Leaving Server. And basically what we looked at is that what's out there currently, what is out for STH? And we this is uh, summarized in this table. I'm not gonna discuss the table in detail, but there are a few things that I would like to draw your attention to. So first of all, if you look at the two columns here is that the first column is that there's not much out there uh, beyond microscopy, the, st the current standard diagnostic method. Um, investments and research has been done on mainly on Ascaris. Second is that some of these new technologies are just in a proof of principle stage. Um, only few has been field tested. And then if we had a look at those that are field tested, uh, we came to the conclusion, basically, that it's very hard to beat Kato Cat's stick smear. Um, and I'm here referring to some work that we've uh, we've done in the past collaborative work that we've done. Uh, I'm not going to show the results in more detail. I'm just going to summarize a bit the conclusions that we draw from each of these papers. So the first paper where we looked at a variety of diagnostic methods, existing diagnostic methods, um, we concluded that only qPCR is more sensitive than, than for all SDH. It's also important to, to acknowledge that each of the diagnostic methods that we looked at, that the specificity is very, very, very high, including KetoCats. Second paper, um, remember that we're also looking at elimination of uh, morbidity, where quantification of infections is quite crucial. So far, these uh, classifications are based on the KetoCats. Um, accounts. And when we compared the classification of intensity infections based on these new diagnostic methods, we had, we find out it's very difficult to, to really have the same classification as for keto cats, where this has been the standard method. For qPCR, just, just, just beyond the, the operational uh, obstacles, um, there are also a few things that we need to clarify here. And then how to, how to best report qPCRs. It turns out not to be that easy. The same applies for qPCR protocols. There are a variety of PCR protocols out there, but none of them are really giving, they're not, they do not always give the same uh, results. And there's also definitely there is some variation across the different laboratories. Sarah was already referring to it in one of her last slides about this quality assurance scheme. Well, this is something that we also did. Turns out that indeed there is a need for it. Um, and ho also highlighting the, the discrepancies in test results across the different labs. One final graph I would like to show you, which is, has not been published, is, is that we looked at um, the, the time to process each of these diagnostic methods that we looked at. We looked at keto cats, we looked at um, single duplicate keto cats, which are indicated here by SKK and DKK, but also the mini Flotec MF, abbreviated here, and FECPAC G2. So we looked at all the different stats, steps, going from entering data, counting of the X, preparing the slides, and entering all the data, metadata of the sample. 
Um, and what strikes us is that majority of the current microscopic methods, because these are all microscopic methods, that the majority of the time spent is on counting the eggs. And so for some of them, it's, it's with one exception, it's about 80% of the time, which the obvious step for us was to look at artificial intelligence based digital pathology, uh, for which uh, colleagues have now shown a more extensive proof that it is that it is really truly really possible. So in other words, we have Cato catch, which is a standard method, which has proven to be very specific, which is indeed what is requested on the TPPs. It lacks sensitivity, but again, we are rest less stringent on the sensitivity as shown in the TPP, but yet it could make a huge difference in the time of resources required in the field. Does that mean we should stop exploring other markers? Please, no, don't, don't get me wrong. I think if the goal, this presentation is, is given in the light of the 2030 targets, I think, um, the 2020 targets, I think KiloCats at this point of time is with some improvements is a way to go. But beyond after for surveillance, I think indeed we should continue looking, exploring markers. And this is also something that we currently doing or field testing in a variety of, of settings. So back from start, um, I hope I've, I've been able to convince or to highlight that specificity is more important than sensitivity, that there are multiple options of specificity and sensitivity, that the performance is linked to study design. So improving the test can reduce the number of samples in the field, which gives flexibility in sample throughput, but also some flexibility in cost per test. And then finally, just be aware of appeal to future discovery fallacy. This is, was my last slide. Thank you very much. and happy to take any questions if there would be any. Thank you very, very much, Bruno, for that. Uh, very, um, very interesting points raised there. I mean, you said in there, investing in better um, sensitivity will reduce operational cost. Um, made a, a huge point. Uh, you ended there with some slides on digital pathology as well. I know we've had sessions with with Levin, uh, with Dr. Levin Stephen from Johnson Johnson on um, the, the artificial intelligence approach. I believe it was Shisto settings about a year ago, and I'm sure we'll, we'll pop the uh, link up to that. But thank you very very much. Wonderful presentation, a lot of food for thought, and I'm sure a lot of the, the uh, attendees are going to be throwing in some questions in and around that. Uh, the Q and A, and on the attendees, we've been welcomed. As a quick shout out, some uh, more attendees. So, Dr. Tekalu Waldkiros has joined us. Hi there from uh, the uh, Hawassa University in Ethiopia. We have Dr. Odama uh, Richard Ikani from the University um, of Calabar in Nigeria. Um, Dr. Mariama Sene from the UGB in Senegal. Who, Mariama was here yesterday for the sessions as well. I hope you enjoyed today as well, Mariama. Thanks for joining us. Dr. Celestine Modugo uh, from the uh, University of Kinshasa and the DRC. Uh, we've got uh, quite a few people. Dr. Ibrahim Raibu, who's the president of the Female Genital Shisto Society of Nigeria, joining us from Nigeria. Um, Dr. Arabador, uh, there are uh, quite a few kind of uh, things. Dr. Levin Stiver from Johnson Johnson, Derek Robinson from the uh, from CNRS in the University of Bordeaux in France, Christina Orling as well, and just thrown in some, uh, from, I believe from the AI4 NTD uh, network has kindly thrown in some uh, links there on the AI um, digital pathology Cato cats that, that Bruno was mentioning, mentioning there. I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions coming through. Um, you meant, and says, really thank you for that. You mentioned the, um, I'm just going to stop your presentation, the, the digital kind of, uh, you, you kind of opened the door quite nicely there because our final, it leads us to our final uh, pa panelist, uh, Dr. Aubrey Cunnington, one of the heads at the Digital Diagnostics for Africa Network and at Imperial College London. Um, and so I think I'll just pass the floor over to you, Aubrey. I think you have to, uh, hi there, good morning. You have to, sh to share screen, I believe. And uh, hopefully that's working for you. Um, it's a delight to be here today. Thank you very much to Cameron and Marianne for inviting me to present at this meeting. 
and I'm going to be talking on behalf of the Digital Diagnostics for Africa Network today. Um, I used to think that uh, diagnosis was easy if you knew what tests to order and that diagnostic research was not a particularly interesting area um, to pursue. But uh, this view has changed throughout my career dramatically and now it's become one of the main focuses of my work. Part of my time is spent as a clinician working in a paediatric infectious disease referral unit in London. And there, um, when I receive a referral of a child with a fever, um, I already have the advantage of them having been seen by uh, highly experienced healthcare professionals who have often taken a very detailed history. But most importantly, I have access to a huge variety of diagnostic tests. And in fact, reaching a diagnosis is usually one of the main things that um, is, is expected from the, the referral of those children. Sometimes over the course of weeks, we will perform hundreds of investigations to reach a definitive diagnosis and be able to prescribe the correct treatment. But a lot of my time in research is spent um, on uh, researching conditions that are prevalent in um, sub-Saharan Africa, particularly malaria, and I have clinical experience of working in uh, sub-Saharan Africa as well, and have seen that um, the situation is very different. So often um, a child with a fever may present to a healthcare facility where there are relatively um, less well-trained uh, staff assessing them, and they have access to very few diagnostics. In fact, it may be that they only have a malaria rapid diagnostic test. Um, if that's positive, the child will receive an anti-malarial. If it's negative, the child may receive an antibiotic uh, or something else. But really knowing what the cause of illness is, um, is very challenging. So why are diagnostic tests so important? Without them, um, we don't know what we're looking at. It's like having the lens covers on on your binoculars. Um, and so therefore, we don't know what is the best treatment. We may give treatments that actually could be harmful. We may give uh, over prescription of antibiotics and drive an antimicrobial resistance. We also don't know the true burden of disease if we don't have diagnostic tests. And we don't know where the disease is geographically and we can't monitor changes in disease or detect emerging pathogens. And Sarah Nagaro already mentioned about the COVID-19 pandemic, but if you think about the situation early in the pandemic, when we didn't have wide availability of diagnostics um, for COVID-19, um, we were really um, in the dark and very much caught out by the, the scale of the, the spread. This slide has already been shown as well, uh, or, or a similar one by Sarah Nagaro, highlighting the excellent Lancet Commission on Diagnostics. And this stark finding that 47% of the global population has little or no access to diagnostics. The WHO publishes an essential diagnostics list, and I think there are about 122 essential diagnostics on the current version the majority for infectious diseases, but it, it's true that the majority of the population in sub-Saharan Africa do not have access to these essential diagnostics. And just to emphasize the points a little bit further, we can contrast these diagnostic ecosystems in a highly resourced country and with um, those in poorer resource settings, particularly uh, in some sub-Saharan African countries. So in the high resource setting, you have a really complex ecosystem where there are many places that diagnostic tests can be performed. There is um, a lot of infrastructure for moving both people and samples to where those, they need to go to get those tests done and for returning results to clinicians and to patients. There are excellent diagnostic facilities in many countries in sub-Saharan Africa now, but they're not universal. They're often located in big cities or in research centers. And the truth is the majority of the population is still um, separated from those by either long distances or um, 
the inability to access them due to cost or both of those. And so an important question is whether improving diagnostics is going to rely on um, trying to change the whole infrastructure um, to uh, develop this complex infrastructure in the highly resourced settings or whether there are alternatives. And we set up the Digital Diagnostics for Africa network to really think about an alternative solution, which is using what we call digital diagnostic technology. And I'll explain this in a minute. Um, but the work that I'm going to present is really um, the, the kind of vision of a large number of people within this network. So what do we mean here by a digital diagnostic? We're talking about a small electronic device that you could carry in your hand um, and into which you can put your sample directly. Um, the sample processing ideally contained within it um, so that you don't have to do anything outside of the device. The analytes are detected in this device, often using a lab on chip platform and results are analyzed within it. Those results may be integrated between different analytes. They may be interpreted to some extent within the device. And what you might get out of it is a simple answer, given anti-malarial, given antibiotic, et cetera. And crucially, um, such a device would be able to transmit data externally. So illustrated by Bluetooth here. And we have such a, a device uh, which has been developed by colleagues at Imperial College led by Pantelis Georgiou, um, which is called Lacewing. And this has been our sort of pathfinder for thinking about how uh, we, can, we can use this type of technology. So illustrated here is a, a previous prototype, but it shows nicely the kind of lab on chip concept in the middle um, that a sample would be placed on this. And on the chip, it will perform loop mediated isothermal amplification. And as that DNA amplification reaction proceeds, hydrogen ions are released uh, with the incorporation of each base pair. And um, that is what is detected uh, on the chip. The signal is sent by Bluetooth to a smartphone on which you receive, uh, you, you generate your results um, and then it can be transmitted on from that smartphone. The smartphone can itself through an app give you clinical guidance, such as what the diagnosis is, but also treat or don't treat decisions. And the transmitted data through mobile networks can give disease surveillance. So we think these types of digital diagnostics can meet the assured criteria. Um, in that they can be affordable by using mass-produced consumer electronic uh, components, very sensitive and specific um, because uh, they are based on uh, nucleic acid amplification technologies, user-friendly, rapid and robust, equipment-free, as in nothing needs to be done externally, and deliverable to end users. And in 2019, it was suggested that these assured criteria were updated with real-time connectivity, which I've demonstrated, and ease of specimen collection. Um, and so capillary blood or um, saliva or, or um, other similar types of samples could go into this. And so this is the, the vision essentially that you have a, a device on its um, smartphone that can give you diagnosis. It might also tell you about severity of illness and provide this decision support so that essentially anyone can use it. So what's the diagnostic potential of this sort of portable nucleic acid detection? Um, and I focused here just on um, some of the neglected tropical diseases. So there's already uh, a considerable program of work using this platform for detection of dengue, um, but could easily be transferred to chikungunya virus as well. I think it would be easy to, to port to a variety of other um, neglected tropical diseases um, where nucleic acid detection of the pathogen would be, be very straightforward. Um, but the other thing that it can do is rather than detecting the pathogen, it can detect the host response uh, through a gene expression profile of a relatively small number of genes. And we have proof of concept data that will be coming out soon showing um, bacterial, viral, TB, inflammatory, and malaria can be distinguished from each other 
using host gene expression profile. And my musing was that this could perhaps be applied to a number of other diseases where um, diagnosis can be tricky. Um, not only can we detect pathogen or host response, but if we're detecting nucleic acid, it can also detect mutations or polymorphisms. And so we have proof of uh, concept data that we can detect anti-malarial resistance mutations, antibiotic resistance and antifungal resistance mutations on this platform. And equally, that could be applied to human genetic polymorphisms or mutations such as those causing sickle cell disease or G6PD deficiency. So I wanted to just give an example of how it could apply not to a neglected tropical disease here, but to, to malaria, which is um, perhaps more a focus of our development at the moment. Um, but I think you'll see the parallels straight away to NTDs. So malaria is preventable and treatable. Um, insecticide treated nets and indoor residual spraying have had a major public health impact. Prompt diagnosis and effective treatments also are very important. But it's not going away, far from it. Um, the most recent World Malaria Report uh, showed that 2020 uh, estimates were of increasing numbers of cases and deaths. And there are some big challenges for malaria control, but similar things may apply to, to many other um, diseases. So for malaria, we have insecticide resistance in the mosquitoes. We have the challenge of detecting low level asymptomatically infected individuals who are now very well demonstrated to be a reservoir for ongoing transmission of malaria. We have parasites that are evading detection by our current rapid diagnostic tests because of mutations in uh, or deletions in key proteins that are detected on some of those RDTs. We have anti-malarial resistance to our major classes of anti-malarial drugs. And I think uh, something that's often underestimated is the challenge of heterogeneity of distribution. Um, and this map just illustrates beautifully how variable um, distribution of malaria uh, is in um, East Africa now. Um, and that you really need to target the areas where you've got the biggest problem, but we don't have real time data. Um, the World Malaria Report uh, comes out presenting data from a year in arrears. And so having real time data is obviously key um, to getting back on track. So lots of things have been suggested for getting back on track with malaria. Um, new insecticides and nets are there's a there's a good pipeline for those. Better diagnostics are key, particularly detecting these low level asymptomatic infections, detecting resistance so we know if it's spreading and developing new anti-malarial drugs, accurate granular data and targeting interventions to where they are needed. And digital diagnostics, uh, as I've outlined, can help with the latter four of these. But I think the, the real big thing from this type of diagnostic is real-time data means you have the potential for real-time responses, and these could be transformative. So that data coming out gives you disease surveillance with geolocation. Um, and as you do more tests, the ability to aggregate and start to analyze that data, to model it and to use it for prediction um, so that you can get ahead of the curve when there are changes in disease uh, incidents. It also allows for quality control. It's increasingly important um, for uh, e-health records that are that are, are um, becoming increasingly popular. And I think a key area is actually helping with logistics to prevent stockouts, um, because if you know when diagnostic tests have been used because you've got the data from them, you know when you need to resupply the diagnostic tests. You also know when you need to resupply the other medicines and medical supplies um, that uh, follow from those diagnoses being made and potentially even where to place your staff and funding. And also uh, data can flow into this sort of system as well. So there can be communication and feedback to practitioners to tell them about what's happening um, epidemiologically and perhaps even use it for running pragmatic clinical trials. So our digital diagnostics for Africa Network has been thinking about this a lot, and now we're going from thinking to implementing. 
um, and evaluating. So we've recently um, received funding from the NIHR in the UK to set up um, a large project with 40 partners across 13 organizations. We're working in Burkina Faso, the Gambia, Ghana, Kenya, Sudan, and Zambia. Um, and this will evaluate 10 digital diagnostic development sub-projects um, at the same time training 10 African PhD students. Uh, and so I'm co-leading this with Halidu Tinto um, from the Clinical Research Unit of Nanoro in Burkina Faso, who unfortunately uh, couldn't attend to present today. And we're very uh, aware that developing a new diagnostic technology like this and putting it into practice is complicated. It's not a straight journey. In fact, um, there may be a natural progression, but it will involve going back on ourselves many times. And that's sort of illustrated here. So at the moment, we've been in the first pillar here where we've been developing prototypes and we've been assessing the situation, the gaps and needs um, and users and context in which we might use this type of technology. And in the next four years, we're going to be taking it through to assessing um, it in an evolving situation where we will be co-developing um, these products with users and stakeholders, um, refining them, um, building new prototypes testing their usability, desirability, feasibility, but always with an eye to the next stage in the journey, which is that we would eventually like to scale them up, achieve regulatory approval, and uh, build them into sustainable business models where they can be implemented. A major component of this work is going to be interaction with all of the users and stakeholders um, that might be involved. And so uh, a lot of questions that uh, we will have to answer here in order to bring these sorts of digital diagnostics into practice. And we will be engaging with all of these groups to see, answer these questions and a lot more. So could this sort of digital diagnostic technology contribute to NTD elimination? We think it potentially provides a way to leapfrog over the need to have hardwired infrastructure to bring better diagnostics um, to um, the most remote places, the places where many of um, the NTDs are most prevalent. And um, I would be very interested to, to hear the thoughts of the audience today on whether you agree with us. So I have to acknowledge uh, this is a huge network now. We've got 80 people in our digital diagnostics network from many partners and our funders, uh, UKRI and uh, soon NIHR and I want to say thank you very much for listening and please if you'd like to uh, learn more about this work have a look at our website uh, the address is here thank you thank you very very much Aubrey for that and a real game changer and a lot of people are picking up on that um, it's a wonderful presentation, a lot of food for thought there. So thank you very much for stepping in to do that. Um, we've been posting some of the links to some of the uh, sessions we've had previously with, with the Digital Diagnostics Network, uh, for Africa Network. Um, and, um, you know, I'm sure people are picking up on that as well as the sites up there as well. So I'm sure you get a lot of feedback from the uh, audience. I know Bruno had to leave. So we're in, without Bruno for the Q&A. Um, however, I just uh, like to start uh, just so you're both here, and I think it's a good place to start um, the, the Q&A off, if that's the case. Firstly, a lot of people are saying thank you very much for the wonderful presentations, and they were excellent. Uh, great opening uh, session, so thank you very much for that. In and amongst that, um, you know, I suppose one of the first questions that, that comes to, to mind, obviously the WHO's uh, roadmap to 2030, the, the shift, one of the key shifts they're talking about is movement from a uh, let's say donor-led kind of um, external donor-led um, model to a more country-driven, country ownership-based uh, model. So within that, how do you actually prioritize? What what are your views on how to prioritize country-level diagnostic action? You know, is it, we're on the other side, not on the other side of COVID. COVID is still the backdrop, in, in especially uh, right across the world. Um, what should we be doing, what should the diagnostics community be doing in terms of uh, inducing uh, country-level action? And I'd like to ask Sarah that first, 
if, if possible. Sure, thank you. Thanks, Cameron. Um, I think initially, uh, you know, countries already have a very good understanding of the disease burden, especially if I just focus on NTDs, um, have a very good understanding of the burden of disease, um, of where these diseases are present within their communities. So really having this, um, you know, the countries take on this uh, ownership and, and political framework in which they can advocate uh, for these communities, um, including them into budget lines. I know it's been very difficult. Uh, the focus, a lot of them has been on implementation, less so on, on diagnostics. Um, and really understanding the priorities from the country's perspective uh, and their achievements and alignments. So um, really supporting that country initiative. Um, yeah, okay, that, that, that's a great answer. Aubrey, from what, what's your perspective on that? I'm asking that because you mentioned uh, in your, uh, well, the one the last slides with the frog leapfrogging over the, the infrastructure, you're bypassing the kind of asset heavy part of diagnostics as it were, and you're kind of perhaps even opening up new kind of employment or new kind of seeing uh, for the youth of those countries or for the the, 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 the people of that country. How, what, what are your views on on this uh, th this kind of question in terms of how do you prioritize country level diagnostic action? What should you be doing? And I, there was a slide you showed there in terms of the various people you talked what, what What are your views on that? Thanks, Cameron. Um, so I think f from our point of view, we think we've got a technology which is in incredibly adaptable. Um, uh, in theory, almost, any infectious disease or other disease which you can diagnose by detecting nucleic acids could, could be put on there. And you can have multiplex combinations. So you don't have to have restrict it to a single disease. You can have syndromic panels, could do multiple things at the same at the same time on the same chip. Um, so that's almost ideal for, for you know, country-led ideas about so what are the priorities here in this country? What would we want to see in our diagnostic panel for use in a particular place in that country or situation? Because it probably isn't going to be one size fits all. Now, I'm not promising that we could develop it for every one of those. Obviously, there'll be a need for, for funding for each development case. But I mean, if there's if there's a strong interest, I think that's where 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 this can go. That, that there's the opportunity to tailor this at a, for, for for a country specific need. Okay, so you, you're adaptable to the actual the the, the needs, and, and that's very obvious in in, in the, your platform as well. So that's a great answer. Um, in terms of the the kind of um, lack of visible or addressing the lack of visibility out there, it's just not centralized. And it's currently not in a format which is easily um, understandable. Um, so we need transparency and clarity on, on where we stand. The WHO GTAG group have done a great job, and especially the subgroups, to identify priority use cases for the different diseases. Now, the next step is about understanding what diagnostic tests are currently available to address these priority use cases and where there isn't, making that apparent so that funders can change where they um, you know, put the funding opportunities to, to, de to develop these tests um, there. What we also, and we hope that the, the portal that's being hosted on the FIND um, website will be useful for that. Um, and we really call for people to, and I guess maybe it's a call for action here, yeah. for people to, to participate um, on, onto this NTD portal, because you know, maybe if we don't get the information, we won't know if it's because there is no information yeah. on that specific use case or diagnostics to address that use case, or is it because people are not participating? So, um, you know, if people are willing to provide this information, making it very um, visual, uh, that we're still working on the data analytics. So how do we gather, you know, collect this information and how do we make it visible and understandable for others uh, is what we're currently working on. But uh, we would really encourage for people to participate to hopefully address uh, or bring clarity um, yeah. onto this uh, landscape. That was definitely a call for action, uh, definitely. And I just wanted to ask you if from the audience, a lot of questions coming through, a lot of interest in, in all of this. Can they just go onto the find site? Is there a link you could perhaps share or are they, are you happy for them to, is that the pathway for them to? 
it will it will be um it will be in the in the coming weeks and it will be maybe something an announcement that can be made uh, where they can link you know click on the link and, and uh, provide the information yes that would be great thank, thank you, you. Th th thanks for that um we've got lots of questions coming through from the audience actually and some of them are quite specific um and some of them are quite kind of wide um so I'm just going to dive into some of these because we, you know, very kindly people have uh, sent sent these questions in. So if so, some of the specific ones first, and then I'll come back to because Aubrey, you've got a, quite a few coming through there for you as well. But we'll go with Sarah first. Um, um, so a question from Tekelau Wald Kiros um, from, uh, from from Ethiopia. Uh, the Hasawana University in Ethiopia. Formaldehyde ether sedimentation technique is a very simple method and helps to concentrate a wide range of geohelminths. I wonder if there's any effort to standardize this method for the purpose of estimating paradise, uh, parasite load or intensity. I'm assuming that was probably for Bruno, who's actually left. So perhaps we can answer that or I can get that over to Bruno after and get that answered. We'll, so we'll, we will get that answered, Tekelau. Um, we'll just move to Lizette's question. Many thanks, Lizette Van Lieshout from uh, Leiden, uh, University of Leiden. Many thanks for three excellent presentations. The importance of ECAS, EQAS, was mentioned by Sarah and Bruno. Participation in ECAS is a very common is very common in clinical diagnostics, but not yet well established for NTDs. Do you have suggestions how to change this? Who could take the lead? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to try to <laughs> address that question. Thanks, Lisette, for, for your question. And I know that uh, she's done a lot of efforts around this. Um, I think there's clearly more communication that needs to be done. Um, maybe it needs to come from the different DTAG subgroups at the WHO. That could be a good starting point. Um, and then I know different NTDs have uh, alliances, for example, the Schistosomiasis one, the one that I'm most familiar with, the Global Schisto Alliance, you know, they can also try and communicate. Points. A starting point, definitely. Um, so that's great. Thank you for that, Sarah. Just moving to Aubrey for a second. Um, the inevitable cost questions are coming through, of course, but we're going to we're going to ask you. Um, so so we have I'll just amalgamate these. So Dr. Ikram, Professor Ikram Guizani, from the Institute Pasteur in Tunisia. Could the technology be used with, so firstly, with other isothermal approaches? And that's to you, Aubrey, before we get into the cost questions. Um, it's a good question. I think in theory, yes, but in practice, um, we have mainly worked with lamp for a, ver a variety of reasons because in the hands of the team that are, are developing the assays um, it tends to be very sensitive and specific um, and perform well at the temperatures that are um, easy to generate on the chip without uh, excessive um, power consumption uh, but we are aware that there are there are alternative um, approaches and I think if the principle is essentially the, the same, so long as you're getting the hydrogen ion release um, as you extend your uh, nucleic acid uh, amplification, then uh, it, 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 almost anything should work on there. Oh, fantastic, Th thank you for that. So just to come to the cost questions, Dr. Benedict Lay, who's from, joining us from Australia, who will be actually speaking about a point of care for a GP6D mutation screening in malaria settings and the adoption of that point of care test at hospitals, I think in the next session or the following session, uh, ben, Dr. Lay is asking, can you comment on approximate prices per diagnosis and the price for hardware and consumables? And it doesn't end there. Uh, the, there's another question on costs from Dr. Gert van der Oera from the Institute of Tropical Medicine, Antwerp, um, digital diagnostics, what price, what price are you aiming at? What about are there problems in chip supply? Will it work for surveillance only when used on a large scale? But diagnostic landscape is, is scattered, how to cope? I mean, you alluded to some of that in some of your slides in terms of the, the differences uh, in malaria outbreaks when it came to different geographies. But in terms of the diagnostic landscape being shattered, prices, problems in chip supply, over to you, Aubrey. Yeah, okay. So uh, it, it, 
ideally we would have uh, one of the kind of product development team from our engineering department here to address those questions yeah. because I may not give you the absolute latest information here but um, all park costs are that the the base unit which is reusable and intended to have a very long lifespan um rechargeable etc um would be somewhere around 100 to 150 pounds um per base unit um and then the cartridges at the moment would be about 10 pounds but we would expect that to come down as uh, they're scaled up in terms of manufacture now there are we, we're very uh, aware of global chip shortages although um you know there's a internationally there's a massive effort to try and solve that problem with alternative sources of chip manufacturing um they are the kind of mass consumer um electronic components so um the ones that are most readily available i think um the thing the, the cost per per diagnosis is a well that's an interesting question because but having 10 10 tests in one rather than doing 10 tests independently potentially is a big cost saving and i think what we haven't yet worked out and is part a big part of the the future project is what's the value of the data that's generated and how does that offset the cost of these devices because undoubtedly it's going to be more expensive than a single pathogen um mm. rapid diagnostic lateral flow test i mean there's no no question about that but there's also no question about the fact that you get totally different information from this type of test to what you would get from one of those single pathogen rdts so um a lot a lot uh, for us to solve here um, and not a straight answer to the question, I'm afraid. But, but there's a good answer, and we appreciate that, Aubrey. Thank you for that. Um, there is a question that's come through around the monster that is regulatory harmonization. So I'm just going to quickly ask Sarah to bring Sarah back into the conversation. Um, it's inevitable that we're going to speak about regulatory harmonization, issues with it, challenges with it, um, looking forward. What are your views on that? And what needs to happen? I mean, what, where are we with it? What needs to happen? Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, I think the reasons we're asking these questions is because that is still that area is still very unclear. Uh, and it's one that all of the diagnostics, especially in NTD community needs to start thinking about. And yeah. um, there was uh, before uh, COVID, there was the, um, you know, PQ to be installed for some of the NTDs or to start off Shisto actually was one of them. Um, it's been postponed. Um, mm. There is, and there has been a recent creation of the WHO uh, Coordinated Scientific Advice, I think yeah. it's called, the WHO CSA. Um, and it's a new, it's sort of a pilot um, in initiative at the moment where anybody who's got questions around diagnostics or therapeutics um, can actually ask the this committee to actually um, get advice on, you know, different questions where the where the you know the diagnostic, for example, should be tested in what communities, how many how many people should be included in studies, etc. And the whole aim of that is really to try and reduce questions further down the line when the WHO, for example, will be reviewing the data um, for to make a policy recommendation. Um, and it's also probably very much in line with some of the regulatory authorities that require certain information uh, before they can make a, a decision as well. And the other one is around really understanding WHO's requirements mm -hmm. uh, on, on, on that. So actually, the creation of this new pilot is, uh, is hugely welcome and hopefully we'll start uh, addressing that um, regulatory question around NTD diagnostics, which is at the moment, from my understanding, still quite vague and, and unclear. Yeah, that's a great answer. Thank you. It's interesting that this pilot started at the uh, WHO. It needs to be addressed, and that's a great. Someone's taking the lead in that. Brilliant. That sounds like a very good uh, starting point. Mm -hmm. Something good to happen. So thanks for the answer. On In terms of regulatory hurdles, uh, Christina, Dr. Christina Orling from Ligature has asked the question to Aubrey in a, in a different spin. Have you encountered any additional hurdles in the regulatory pathway quagmire 
uh, in terms of digital diagnostics compared to, let's say, traditional approaches. That's to Aubrey specifically. <laughs> Thanks, Cameron. Um, so at the at the moment that these, as I was trying to explain, we are uh, earlier in this journey than um, applying for regulatory approval. So we are still trying to work out what's going to fit where, what are the use cases or advanced cases for malaria. Um, Kenny Malpartidas is going to do that. But um, so we, we haven't got a version of this, this test for any of the, the diseases I've spoken about, um, which has passed regulatory approval yet. It's in development. Which has, oh, that's a great answer. And, and yes, and Kenny will be uh, working later. Uh, Dr. Orling, Dr. Christina Orling made a point as well. It's kind of a statement, really, I guess. It's a question, but in light of what you've both just said, she's saying, do we need to, well, I think you both answered that, do we need to work tighter as a community to get better guidance on the regulatory pathway? Absolutely, it would appear. And certainly the Sarah's point on the uh, embryonics of the, um, the uh, WHO's pilot might be that kind of focal point. So excellent. Uh, for that. Brilliant. Um, I think we've had quite a few, we've answered that question. A question from the University of um, uh, Reading, uh, Al Edwards, who will be uh, actually presenting later in the session in the day. Quite a general question, maybe not enough time. Do we do, we do enough field validation for point of care tests? If point of care tests are used unsupervised, how can we be confident that they are accurate or do we need more effort in supporting local QA for point of care products? And I'll ask that to both of you. We'll go with Sarah first. Yeah, thanks. That's a, a great question. Um, so there is what we call normally demonstration studies. So after uh, a product is uh, has gone under clinical validation trials, um, under very stringent uh, regulations, um, making sure that the data is collected in a specific way and then is gathered to be presented to regulatory authority bodies. We then go into what we call demonstration studies where the diagnostic then goes in hand uh, outside of these clinical trial settings. And the problem here, I guess, is we need more of those, um, but it's often the lack of funding uh, to run these trials and these studies. Um, and the lack of time. Um, so definitely I would suggest that we continue on that, doing those and advocating for them, but it's often down to a question of, of funding um, yeah. to conduct these studies. Great answer. Aubrey, any, thank you for that, Sarah. Any uh, input onto that in terms of Al Edwards' question? I, I, I agree with Sarah. I mean, I think it's a really important um, area. I suppose for, for us, the approach we're taking that I, Kind of alluded to is that um, actually there should be very little for the operator to do with these digital diagnostic devices apart from put the sample into it yeah um, and so it would have a positive control that would confirm that sample was inside it and um, just to make sure you didn't run it with water or something so um, and then it in in fact um, the the data that's coming out of it would be pro also providing that sort of quality control because it would be telling you the performance of the device. There's a lot more than what you would see on the screen that would be potentially transmitted from it. So it would be information about its quantitative performance, the amplification curves and so on um, that are happening on, on the device. So I think you would have a sort of quality assurance and be able to then come back and address that if you saw that in a particular place, um, a lot of tests were failing for, for example, um, then you'd have to come back and retrain. Yeah. And that's a very interesting um, answer. I, know, I remember you once, I think it was Nicholas Moser from, uh, from, from the network, I think you mentioned um, schools were, and, and perhaps in, were part of the target in terms of the operators for, your, for the lace wing or for you know, the, this kind of point of care approach. The, the um, I mean, I think, we, we envisage a model in which almost anyone could could use this because once you've got a smartphone interface, it can also be the way that you have your um, a, a sort of walkthrough guide of what to do to be able to run the test with visuals, whatever, whatever you need. So, you know, you could just press a button and it'll say, open the cartridge, spit inside it, 
put it into the test, um, into the device, press this button, it starts running, you'll get your result on the screen and it can tell you what to do. So I think I think there are many ways of simplifying the operation um, mm -hmm. it, it, to, to enable anyone who can follow instructions and they could be verbal instructions if they, if they can't um, read. So I think many possibilities to customize it. Um, yeah, so in theory, you you could have it in somewhere like a school, I guess. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that, that's a very interesting part of the game changing nature of uh, of what you're doing. We mentioned the F word, funding and financing. I suppose we have to end on that. Market failure is the term that you've used yourselves in your in your presentation, and that is what really has scarred the kind of this quadrant in terms of the healthcare quadrant, the diagnostics part of it. What needs to happen? So I mean, if every year we'll have this. This is the ninth annual for us, the D3 meeting. We've always had a diagnostics day. Um, we felt it was underreported from day one. Finance has always been the issue, right? Who pays for all these investments? What kind of models are out there? What's your view on it? What needs to change? I mean, I'm going to ask that to Sarah first. Um, yep, yeah, it's a difficult one. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we need to be a bit more creative in our thinking and within the entity community. And we need to, and if I take the, exa the example of Shisto, for example, there are other non-NTD health initiatives in which actually Shisto could fit very nicely um, in terms of, you know, exploring different funding avenues. And one of them, for example, is HIV through the female genital uh, schistosomiasis. And we know that having FGS actually gives you an increased risk to, to HIV. So um, we need to be a bit more creative in our thinking mm -hmm. of how do we, for these programs to be sustainable in the long term when donor funding will run out, mm -hmm. um, that, you know, it also takes time for countries to build the, the, the resources and invest into NTDs because it's uh, you know, it's not that easy either, uh, so we need time for that to happen. But we also need to be a bit more innovative and creative, and perhaps, you know, breaking silos is not even within NTDs, but it's uh -huh. between diseases as well. Uh -huh. And but we need to also make sure that we're not overwhelming by just transferring NTDs onto another disease. Yeah. That we're overwhelming that as well. So we need to be a bit cautious. But I think, as a community, we can be. We need to be more innovative, and I'm sure we will. Yeah, that, that's a brilliant answer. Um, Aubrey, your views on it, and I think that will be the last uh, question we're going to have. There was a question from Professor Ikram Guziani about stability and cold chain, um, which we can answer. But, uh, the, the, this will, she will come to you in a second, so that will be the last question. This, uh, so in terms of funding and financing, you know, you're looking at it from a different perspective, I guess, a startup going somewhere. What, what, what are your views? I, I think it's it's pretty clear talking to, to people who have tried this before that there is no magic way of doing this. Uh, you've got to think about it from the very, very beginning. Um, you might have a great idea for how a diagnostic test, a, a new test might work, but uh, you've got to have this eye on, you know, what's the commercial um prospects for for that test oh, of the the yeah. mountain um because it, you know it's not it, it, there are unpredictable forces at, at play here in the markets and there, mm -hmm. there may be even opposition to something from from powerful commercial players mm -hmm. if it encroaches on on mm -hmm. their territory so i <laughs> probably can't answer it any better than that but to yeah. say You've got to think about it from the, the start and yeah. um, you've got to accept there's no guarantee that uh, you no. will overcome that final hurdle at the end. Um, well, I, I, that's a great answer. And I, I do hope next year we're here discussing the new PRV for diagnostics. <laughs> there's one for, for, for diseases, but come on, it, something has to happen, right? So let's see, hopefully in a year from now, maybe we will start. Fingers crossed with that. Um, there is a final question on stability in cold chain by uh, Professor Ikram Guziani from the Institute Pasteur in Tunisia. Um, Aubrey, would you have any show? I think that's specific to, to Aubrey. Uh, yeah. I can answer very quickly. So for, for Lacewing, um, that, that problem has been largely solved by um, a patented method of lyophilizing the reagents. 
um, and so they're they're dry um, and they are long term stable and ready to to go and they don't need to be stored cold. Brilliant. So that's an excellent answer. Um, and I just wanted to say I'm being asked to we have to shut the room and, and move to the next session. So I just want to say thank you very, very much indeed for a wonderful opening session. It really has set the scene and got people thinking in terms of what needs to change. Where do we need to go with certain kind of issues here? Um, and it's set the you know, a lot of conversation in place. You've seen from the uh, Q&A that's been coming through from the audience, been very, very well received. A round of applause for yourselves and a round of applause for the wonderful audience for the questions and the engagement. Um, we are now going to have a quick 15 minute break, I think, and then we're going to be jumping to the next session. The link is in the chat box, which is novel point of care diagnostics. A little bit of a dive into some of those kind of um, well, some developments in different diseases and then have a kind of chat around uh, how that would kind of work. Um, so that's brilliant. Uh, so that's good. I hope you can all join us for that. Um, again, thank you very much for the panelists. And I think a lot of the, a lot of the feedback that's coming through from the um, great session. Thank you, uh, Al Edwards from uh, Reading, Ikram Guziani from the Institute Pastor. Great session. Lizette Van Lightout, great session. Francesca Pfeiffer from the Digital uh, Diagnostics Network. Thank you, everybody. Fantastic session. It was indeed a fantastic session. Thank you very, very much. It's okay. enough for me. <laughs> I have to, I have to go. Have a wonderful day, everybody.